well, thank you very, thank you all very much for coming. And uh, I'm Rich Ketchum. I'm the um, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the Jackson School and the current interim chair of the geology department, if you don't know who I am. Uh, it's a great honor to be um, working with this panel here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce them all uh, briefly in what I, th I think is reverse age order. And um, <laughs> so I'd like to start with our, our student member, Emily Cooperdock, who's a PhD student working with Dr. Danny Stockley. Um, very daring work on developing the uranium thorium helium method for magnetite and minerals that are can be mistaken for magnetite like chromite. Um, and uh, means for figuring out the timing of serpentinization, a very basic geologic um, problem that's really hard to get data on. Whitney Baer is an assistant professor of ge in, uh, in our department. Whitney got her PhD at USC and after a postdoc at Brown joined us in uh, 2012. Her research focuses on the mechanics and kinematics of continental deformation at plate boundaries and spans a huge range of spatial and temporal scales. So she works with um, deforming plate boundaries using geomorphology at the, uh, in the San Andreas area and also uh, deep-seated shear zones and core complexes, among other places. Uh, Whitney uh, won the Subaru Outstanding Woman in Science Award from GSA, uh, the Knievel Teaching Award in our department, and was recently awarded an NSF Career Grant. Dr. David Morig is a professor in the department here who received his PhD in, from the University of Washington in 1994, did a stint working for Exxon Production Research and F Exxon Upstream Research, and rose to senior research geologist there, and skipped over, over, over to uh, MIT in academia and joined um, after, and we were able to draw him away, and I learned this. I believe he was the first quote unquote Jackson hire, somebody hired as a result of the Jackson bequest information at the school, and I think uh, it's widely acknowledged we hit a home run with that one. Um, David focuses on um, application of sedimentary deposits and transport processes to unraveling the evolutions of terrestrial and submarine landscapes. Uh, among other things, he uh, you'll find he's a, for good reason, he's a regular winner of our Knievel Distinguished Teaching Award, a repeat offender in that respect. Shirley Dutton is a senior research scientist at the Bureau of Economic Geology. She worked uh, at the, briefly at the USGS and then came to Texas for her graduate work, um, completing her PhD in 1986 and throughout her graduate career and since working at the Bureau. Uh, her specialty is sandstone petrography and diagenesis and its relationship to porosity, permeability, and development of oil and gas reservoirs. Uh, she's won the, um, a lot of the Jackson Awards Research Excellence and the Overall Excellence Award, uh, Walter Excellence Award at the Jackson School, and also the uh, Lever Leverson Memorial Award from the Southwest section of AAPG. And that brings me to George Davis, our keynote speaker. Um, George is a Re Regents Professor Emeritus and Provost Emeritus at the University of Arizona. He received his master's degree here from the University of Texas and um, his PhD from Michigan. And, um, and after that, he spent most of his uh, academic career at the University of Arizona, uh, rising through all the ranks, all the way through all the professor ranks up to Regents Professor, jumped over to leadership when he um, became Vice Provost for Academic Affairs, Executive on Loan to the Board of Regents, Interim Vice President for Business Affairs. Um, University of Vermont grabbed him away for a few years to be their president, but he ended up going back to the University of Arizona, uh, back to teach, and also serving as Executive Vice Provost, Vice President and Provost at the University of Arizona. Um, he left all those, that administrative stuff in 2007. He's still teaching there. He, um, uh, he served as the president of GSA in 2012 to 2013. Um, I read through the, this, I, did, I couldn't pick from this huge number of awards, but I liked the, he was a, a recipient of the Inspire Integrity Award um, from the National Society of Collegiate Scholars. Uh, he's got an honorary doctoral degree and he has got, um, he's got a standing gig somewhere. He's gonna be a commencement speaker in May, somewhere around the country. <laughs> Uh, including he's done so here and many other places. Um, I also want to say that, uh, you know, just on a personal note, um, I did my study abroad in my junior year of my college education at uh, the University of the Exotic University of Arizona, uh, with the you know where um, I was able to take structural geology from George Davis, and it was e easy sell for my geology department because I could take the course from the guy who wrote the book and. Um, and I just also, on a personal note, I want to say that um, George's 
a fair measure of the reason I stuck with geology, yeah, um, and because his was the classroom where you go into it and see how much somebody could possibly love the geosciences. And it was very, um, very infectious. Thanks, Rich. George Davis. Okay, thanks so much. Well, I love especially the last part of that introduction. Uh, yeah, it, enthusiasm for what we love to do is so important, isn't it? It really makes such a difference and can cut through so many things. Yeah, um, it's an honor to be here as, as a keynoter, uh, to come back home to UT Austin. Um, I'd like to basically launch right into uh, a sense of the grand challenges and the opportunities and in breakthroughs where breakthroughs are likely to take place or the conditions under which they're likely to take place. And don't we all know that if we look back several decades, even a couple of decades, maybe if we just look at ourselves right now, so much in the in geology is driven by the subdisciplines. There was a time where the subdisciplines, I'm talking stratigraphy, structure, geomorphology, in the earth sciences were an end in themselves, right? And yet there's a, there's a growing understanding that, yes, our subdisciplines are means to an end. They're a means to attack higher order challenges and problems through time. But in terms of discovery, one of the ironies about it all is that, you know, there, there's, there's something unreasonable about discovery. Uh, these are words from Robert Gruden, one of my favorite authors. He would say that discovery suggests surprise. We cannot discover something we have expected to find. And, and Robert Gruden thinks about, you know, who are the folks who are most likely to make discoveries? He would argue, as a humanist, that major discoveries are made by people who are habitually alert to non-conforming data, habitually attuned to the little dissonances and coincidences of phenomena. Uh, the only people who can be sure that the data are non-conforming are those with a sure sense of form. And the only people who can justify their own intuitions are those who have the method to, to test and support them. Great discoverers seem to be so fully in control of method that method has all but ceased to be a drain on their awareness. Having mastered order, they are open to the chaos of discovery. I think Robert Gruden is speaking to this irony that we really need to go deep in our specialty areas in order to be able at the same time or eventually to broaden out into major impactful discoveries. When we think of grand challenges, how grand is grand? One of my latent colleagues and close friends, Peter Coney, you know, he would take some risks, although he wasn't worried about it, kind of in a disparaging way, he would refer to research being carried out by me or others, maybe not me, and he wouldn't be quite as bold as that, but he would say, it's a non-problem, you know, this is mop-up, you know. The kinds of challenges that we think of is extraordinarily important. They're being funded by NSF. Peter would sometime mumble, non-problem, mop-up. And for our department, the University of Arizona, Peter's calibration of what constitutes something grand was really, really important in attracting faculty and, and making progress. One of the things that I learned in the process of preparing for this keynote is that when you take a look at lists of grand challenges that have, that have been discovered through panels drawn from subdisciplinary niches like structural geology tectonics or geomorphology, there's, a, there's quite a difference in their height and their character in contrast to grand challenges that have issued from panelists and committees that are drawn from completely across the earth sciences. And I'd like to play with that distinction for a bit. If we, take, if we take a look at those grand challenges that are derived from panels from subdisciplines, some are, are, are quite generalized. Look at this, understanding the full range of earth process, process behaviors as recorded at deep time, and so on and so forth. Some are more tactical than strategic. And it's good to be tactical, especially when the prize is really important and large, that is trying to get to the solution of a well-stated problem through tactical considerations. So the geochronology community in advising NSF's earth science 
you know, talks about let's try to gain plus or minus 0.01% age precision and accuracy from the Cenozoic to the Hadean. Uh, let's cover all thermal conditions ranging from the cryosphere through the brittle ductal transition to magmatic environments. Some grand challenges are classic and long lived. These came out of the structure tectonics think session, you know, how to fault slip, what's the role of fluids, how do magmas ascend and erupt, you know, how do plate boundary systems evolve. You know, these are, these are the grand challenges that are listed. You can find them on websites, right? Some are all encompassing. Read this, you know, how do rates and patterns of erosion influence growth of individual structures, origin kinematics, metamorphism, and exhumation? That's a grand challenge. And how can we extract quantitative information about climate and tectonic processes and histories from topography? This came out of the 2002 NSF Earth Sciences Tectonics Program workshop. Some are deeply existential, you know, for example, offering insight into possible outcomes of major environmental changes in the future. So um, my, my first conclusion is that these are the grand challenges that we commonly think about that are actually the bread and butter in terms of where breakthrough sciences are taking place. They're not surprises. None of these grand challenges are surprising to us. These are what we encounter and we participate in gnawing on at AGU meetings, GSA meetings, AAPG meetings, Penrose conferences, you know, Gordon conferences, the journals, and the Jackson School has been for decades in the thick of things in relationship to these grand challenges. And they'll continue, you will continue to be a major player uh, in pursuing the grand challenges that most breakthroughs uh, will originate. But there are other kinds of grand challenges as well. And I call these, at least I began to call them as I prepared for this talk, overarching grand challenges, like on the old Perea movie set here. You know, these, these overarching grand challenges are ones that issue from panelists or panels drawn from across the earth sciences. And the characteristic of these, in my view, is that I think to qualify on a short list of overarching grand challenges, to qualify if you're around a table as a panel, there needs to be an explicit relationship to connection tangibly and traction with what's going on in society. They're, they're interdependent. It's basic research and it's translational research and it's society, opportunities and issues. And where do we find these listed? Well, NRC, you know, emphasizes f five grand challenge imperatives. They're all related to closely coupled processes. The list is familiar, right? Natural resources, natural hazards, engineering infrastructure, ecosystem management, terrestrial surveillance for national security, which includes mapping and, and subsurface uh, evaluations. Uh, there are other examples of overarching grand challenge. The GeoVision report that came out of the, uh, the, the Geo Advisory Committee at NSF a number of years ago, 2009. There are several grand challenges described. I'm, I'll mention two here. One is in relationship to understanding behavior of complex and evolving complex systems and their nonlinearity and, and let's face it, how attempting to work out these processes so importantly draws upon deep time, the interpretations of processes in deep time, to look at what for millions of years may have been stable systems. And the other GeoVision challenge that's explicitly listed in this 2009, 2009 would be in relationship to geohazards and, and resiliency. Uh, but having said this, I think it's particularly difficult for any university, any university with geosciences programs, to find a way to address and attack overarching grand challenges. Um, in part because the, the listing and the taxonomy of the, of the overarching grand challenges seem so generalized in relationship to what our bread and butter day to day, month to month, year to year work looks like. And so how do you get, tra how do you get traction? Uh, my sense is that you don't begin to get traction unless you have a strong outreach arm. And that's where the Jackson School has a, has a huge advantage over so many programs. My sense is in addressing uh, overarching grand, 
grand challenge is if there's no if there's no outreach arm in sight, you're almost toast, right? Because you don't have what the the, the folks in the health health science centers would say is the opportunity to go from the bench to the bedside to do that translational research that that's so is so important. But with the bureau in this united that's that's Jackson's word, right? It's a united array of, of three units, uh, three centers of excellence, there's an opportunity not to be the way I was years ago, up in the top of a tree in a more vulnerable position, that is programs that don't have an outreach arm are sitting there in an extremely vulnerable position if it comes to trying to address overarching grand challenges. The other, the other thing that's key is, and I think this is a challenge for everyone, including the Jackson School, how do you find the language, the mantra, the specific wording of challenges that, that gives interpretation to a cohort, you know, a set of colleagues, a university, a community, about what really is the goal and the mission and how to get there? And as I was searching around preparing for this talk, I stumbled upon uh, the grand challenges for Earth Resources Engineering. And their statement of the overarching grand challenge, to supply society with its essential needs for energy, minerals, groundwater, and to use the earth itself as a resource for protecting people and the environment. So that's the mantra that they came up with. But then they go into more specificity by saying, okay, there are three specific pieces we need to be interested in and working on. Two of them apply so specifically to geology. Making the earth transparent. I love that language. You know, it's not, there's, the word pseudo tacolite and ultra myelinite is not in that language. It's just making the earth transparent and understanding subsurface coupled processes. The concept of making the earth transparent is one that's really important to me. When I was working on my GSA presidential address, I happened to go to a talk, not happened, I went to a talk deliberately by Jeff Daniels at Ohio State University talking about hydraulic fracturing. And what, and what does Jeff say? He said in this talk, I'm paraphrasing, geoscientists represent the only profession anywhere that knows how to picture the subsurface. He proclaimed that voters, communities, other scientific communities, most citizens, public officials have no idea how to visualize what's down below, let alone discriminate between what is factual from what is not, let alone evaluate proposed solutions. I think it's a very strong and, and undervalued description of what geoscientists do well. So that's one of, their, uh, of the uh, recommendations or challenges. And the other that was stated is the understanding subsurface coupled processes. We keep going back to that time and again with the idea that if we understand those processes, then there's a payoff at the end in this, in this long list of applications to society. So, you know, what should the Jackson School, what should the Jackson School be doing to lead? Isn't that an amazing phraseology that I wrote down? What should? So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. You know, it's um, the dose of reality that I would provide is, is a dose of a reality that we're all familiar with. That is, we live in a world of research where our reward system is for short articles in high impact journals that come out every three days. Well, I'm overstating a little bit. And we work in a life with clients and with research grants that are framed in terms of two, three, or four years. And this is our bread and butter. This is how we are evaluated. This is how we, uh, th th these are the factors that that really determine how we feel about life. And so we frame our research, don't we, in the way that we know we must frame it in terms of our sub-specialty niches, and maybe we connect with other colleagues to connect two or three or four sub-disciplinary niches. But it's the fundamental conservative nature of we academics and research scientists uh, that diminishes the potential for flexibility and innovation and cross-unit synergy. I mean, take for example, I'm speaking as a provost right now, you know, universities believe that it's because of higher administration that faculty need to walk in lockstep, 40% research, 40% teaching, and 20% service. 
you know, I don't think we can blame that on some higher authority. We are comfortable as academics with this, quote, fairness, you know, of 40-40-20. We don't want to work in environments where maybe somebody's doing 60 research versus 20 teaching versus 20. And so we don't take advantage, in my view, of the flexibility that we have. But I'm, su I'm suggesting that the Jackson School has a tremendous opportunity. It's hard, it's challenging to deal with reward systems and motivations and synergies such that uh, there, there is action taking place across the three parts. And I think if it were done well, it could be, it could be basically uh, a role for and a model for other universities and departments. The Jackson School may be able, in short, to achieve an optimum environment for breakthrough discovery, which requires continuously advancing an innovative system of support and rewards that maximize both individual and united, united achievement. You know, so the, the challenge is trying to do the bread and butter work that's so important to break through grand challenges, while at the same time finding a way as a community of scholars and investigators to work away, work on these overarching pieces and to know how one's own individual work is related to the, the grand challenges. So can shorter term specialized research projects directed toward grand challenges be advanced while also carrying out the synergistic pursuit of one or more overarching grand challenges within a longer time frame. So what pragmatic and cultural shifts on how work is conducted and rewarded would be required? The rewards are there, I think increasingly in the future, when, when science is evaluated and breakthrough discoveries are evaluated, they're evaluated in, in, in important ways with respect to the impact of the research on this world we live in and, and on the cultures and on the society within which we live. The rewards will come in that way. And in that respect, I think we can learn from the best of the health sciences uh, research units. I think of MD Anderson, uh, in the University of Texas system, which has a, 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 an overarching grand challenge. We're going to eliminate cancer. And it has a, a coupled process where the research is not all about medicine, but it's about, it's, it's, it's about basic biology. It's, a, it's about sociology. It's about cultural differences and, and so on and so forth. And I think the opportunity to use a kind of a model like that philosophically uh, is that our Earth itself re requires some urgent care at this particular point in time, at the, in at the interface of resources and energy and natural hazards and sustainability and security and so on. I think the school is one of the few places that has the critical mass to carry out the normal business of geological discovery in relationship to grand challenges, but to additionally lead in addressing overarching grand challenges. Now, the MD Anderson image, I think, is kind of interesting. I had, I had, I had kind of written that out in draft form. And then one night, I'm listening to pundits. You know, we're listening to a lot of pundits in this campaign, this extended campaign season. And the pundits were talking about Barack Obama's State of the Union address. And what does he say in the State of the Union dress? We're going to do a moonshot. And the moonshot is to eliminate cancer. Well, moonshot is MD Andersonian language. They have their moonshots. There was no specific reference to MD Anderson. But it's interesting to ask the question, will the Jackson School at some time influence the State of the Union address? And if so, uh, what will it be? Even though it might not be acknowledged explicitly by the president, they might use language we're familiar with moonshot. You know, what's that language in the Jackson School that's going to be picked up by the President of the United States? Well, you know, th this is where I'm really going to go off on uh, unsteady ground, you know, risky ground, but what the heck. I'm an outsider. I could drink that bottle of tequila while I'm up here, you know. <laughs> Maybe I should. But I'm thinking, what within the Jackson School, in terms of an overarching grand challenge, could create a like of a glue that's, that's in relationship with, with the history and the tradition of the place and forward-looking. And so I'm playing around with critical zone. I love that. The currency of critical zone science, you know, it's there. I don't know who came up with that critical zone science, but it's really good. 
You know, and NSF talks about the critical zone being from the top of the vegetation up there in the canopy down to the base of the soils. I know it can be defined in a lot of different ways, but why not redefine it and rename it for purposes here like the critical zone subsurface? You know, that subsurface, which is the buffer, you know, between what's going on in the mantle, the deep crust. It's the buffer between processes that affect the landscape, that affect geological hazards. You don't even have to define how thick it is, the subsurface, because there's no geophysical or geological parameter which we can use to do it. But if, but if one were to basically emphasize the studies of the critical zone subsurface, and also knowing that every subsurface is different as you move from one county to another, one state from another, one country from another, but it all requires this subsurface vision to picture what's happening below, and not just some static scene that you can seismically image, but what are the processes going on? What are the coupled processes that are going on? So um, that's just a thought, you know, critical subsurface, um, critical science subsurface. Well, how does all this affect impact education? How does this impact education and students? Well, and we're Scott. You have the hook yet or am I okay on time? We're okay. So just as you know better than anyone in this country that panels have been assembled to think hard about education in our sciences. And the panels draw academic types. They draw industry. I'm looking at Sharon. She's pulled these things together. And there are grand challenges that are framed in terms of this. And we know <coughs> these, that these educational essentials, which I call them, <coughs> have very little to do with the requirements of a major. They're instead their habits of the mind that are essential in addressing grand challenges and overarching grand challenges. I was telling my, my MA uh, research advisor, Bob Boyer, who's with us today, where are you, Bob? Somewhere over here. Uh, that when I, before I even unpacked my car, when I came here to UT Austin in 1964, before I found an apartment, Professor DeFord called me into his office. He referred to me as Mr. Davis. He had my transcript in his hand. Mr. Davis, we don't think you know enough optical mineralogy. You went to the College of Worcester, and all the optical mineralogy you ever took was in one course. And that, uh, that course also included metamorphic igneous and sedimentary petrology. I don't think you know enough optical mineralogy. So he calls up Robert Falk. I had only heard about this legend. Falk walks into the office 10 minutes later. DeFord says, test him on optical mineralogy. Falk says, my car's unpacked, you understand? You know, he says, Mr. Davis, what is 2V? You no, know, he says, do you know what 2V is? I said, yes. He turns to DeFord and says, he's okay. And he walked out. <laughs> And I thought, I'm going to be a contender. <laughs> Educational essentials have little to do with core requirements for a major, but instead are habits of the mind, systems, behavior, and processes. Is there a theme here? Cross-disciplinary interaction, making fuller use of models, and then these cognitive dimensions, 3D and 4D thinking, inductive and deductive reasoning, making and using indirect observations. And so it goes. What's the relationship of all of this to the geology requirements at the University of Arizona? Not much. There's an enormous gap between the results of the strategic national conversations on educational essentials and the culture of curriculum and teaching in academic departments. I teach my course in structural geology. I've got 54 students this semester. They will evaluate me. I still grind my teeth a little bit waiting for the results. They don't evaluate me with respect to any strategic concerns. Or, or curriculum. They just say, how, how was Davis in the classroom? And then when we begin to worry about curriculum, we worry more about responsibility-centered management and budgeting at the university level. You know, how, how much money are we going to get into our department if we teach geological disasters in society as opposed to optical mineralogy? And suddenly we just sort of spiral downward. What a gap this presents. What an opportunity for the Jackson School. I mean, do you have the capacity and the courage to basically say, let's try, some, let's try some new things. Let's see if we can break away from an inertia that is in complete contrast to what we are saying, not we're in 
not when we're when we are in our departments, but when we're when we fly to Washington or Chicago and we sit around a table as a panel member and we're asked, hey, what do you think we should be doing heroically in curriculum? And things come out of our mouth that bear no relationship to what we're doing back home in our departments. Oh yeah, what am I teaching next semester? Oh, I'm teaching structural geology. What's its relationship to basin analysis? Well, that's not my problem. Pete DeSells will take care of basin analysis. So I'm getting carried away. I'm preaching a little bit, okay? But a few free suggestions here at the end because all of these things are going to take a lot of time. Uh, for graduate students, how about, how about offering seminars that basically has a plethora of papers that are considered to be best papers by our distinguished divisions in AGU and GSA? What makes up a best paper? For undergraduate majors, I felt for some time, although I've never implemented, why not have a class or a seminar where undergraduates read the public policy statements written by AGU and GSA. They're all in lay language, they're written for politicians, and, they're t and it's just a listing of all the things that we should be worried about, like coastal erosion, you know, along the East Coast, in plain language. And for under undergraduate majors, how about, or graduate students, you know, how about overarching grand, grand challenge courses that are taught by a cohort of Jackson School investigators drawn from the three centers. My free advice is exploit your tradition in field geology and field work. Hit it harder than any other department in the nation and include how you sensibly and intelligently sample things for back home in the lab analysis. I taught geological mapping last spring and one beautiful day I was riding high, it was fantastic. I said to these 25 students, you know, none of you will ever be doing any geological mapping. You know, and you're going to be thinking, you know, in the future, you're going to be saying, what a great day it was in the spring of 2015 out there on Pistol Hill. But I'm saying anybody who carries out geological mapping is dealing with these educational essentials, dealing with ambiguity, seeing 3D, 4D, all this stuff that makes students and us miserable at times when we're trying to figure out field relationships. That's why we're in the field trying to map things. And then push cross-sections harder than any school in the world. Why not? You've got the bureau, you've got the institute, you can, the, the department, you can do it on all scales. Cross sections of paleoseismic trenches, cross sections of the critical zone, writ small, cross sections of the lower crust than the upper mantle. It can go and go and go, and when your graduates move out of here, there'll be people who notice that these folks can, can see 3D uh, in the way that Jeff Daniels is saying is a great need in society. Now, how about this little quotation? Graffiti on a men's room wall, Jimmy's Bar, Chicago. Time is simply nature's way of keeping everything from happening all at once. You know, things take time, don't they? They really take time. And, uh, and, and I want to get to, uh, I'm almost there. Um, I've left my text behind here, didn't I? Uh, who cares? Um, Robert Gruden. Back to Robert Gruden. Time is both our friend and our enemy. This is my language. Time is both our friend and our enemy in making scientific progress and in achieving lofty goals as a school. We want to get there overnight in both, but both take time and sustained effort. Now here's Gruden. Discovery more often waits upon those who conceive of achievement as part of a communal effort than upon those who want it as a personal prize. And then he says, and this is something to gnaw on, the best kept secret about real achievement is that it is synonymous with contribution. Robert Gruden. Finally, my personal thanks to UT Geo for helping me get started uh, through an incredible opportunity and in master's thesis work in Guatemala. And I threw this in a couple of nights ago saying, hey, I want to thank folks but then it suddenly dawned on me, this is probably the most important thing that you do, creating an environment for investigators and students that allow them a greater potential to make breakthrough discoveries at whatever level. Thank you. Right. Thanks, George. Um, I could have easily listened to you for the entire hour like I used to do for three times a week. Um, but now it's the time to um, 
uh, for me to ask some questions of our panel and get them to, uh, to speak on these topics. Also, as one more piece of our roadmap, those of you at the round tables will notice that there are index cards and pens there. Um, I, the idea for those is that if any of you have questions you'd like to ask of your panel, uh, of, of the panel, uh, please write them down and get them up to me somehow, and I will attempt to get through some of those questions, too, if they come. Otherwise, we'll just talk among ourselves uh, with you all. But um, what I wanted to do first was, um, well, thank you for some really great ideas, and they really um, mirror or feed into or are related to a lot of the things that we've been talking about in the Jackson School. And um, we've been go we're in the latter stages of our own strategic planning process here. And so we've got some of our strategic planners up on the stage with us. And so I wanted to start by asking, um, how is the Jackson School uh, determining what its grand challenges are? What are we going to contribute to? You might need to push the button. Okay. No, am, I, am I on? Great. You're on. So uh, what is the, how is the Jackson School determining what it's, the grand challenges that resonate within the school are? And the, the Jackson School is, a, is an interesting place and an interesting size. And as a result, it has multiple uh, studies going on to, to look at those grand challenges. They're, they're not only things happening at the unit scale with strategic planning going on at the Bureau and at the Institute and in the department. But there's also been, particularly over the, the past five years, maybe longer, but I think about five years, a, a very concerted uh, bottom-up effort to understand what, what resonates in terms of, of research within, within the Jackson School across the unit. So this, is, this has been driven by the, by the, uh, the practicing scientists and that has been uh, refined through time. And, and, and I think what it's showing is that what resonates in terms of the real challenges and the real opportunities are, are things to do with transitions. So these transitions are both in time and in space. Uh, in, in, in space, for example, it may be geodynamical coupling of mantle to the lithosphere to the surface of the Earth and the consequences of understanding those processes. Or it could be looking across a plate boundary or looking across a shoreline. But it's not just the spatial transitions. It's also those in time. We have a lot of researchers who are quite interested in events that produce catastrophic change and events that produce, that don't, that are substantial environmental events as far as we can determine them from, from proxies in the geologic record, but uh, haven't had the same sort of environmental impact as others. Why does that happen? How does that happen? What, how does the system respond? All of that work is also very much being used within the Jackson School to look forward to, uh, there's uh, quite a number of people in the school talking about Earth 2100, this idea that we can take what we understand about the Earth system and use it to uh, use that science to help ensure Things like clean and adequate water, clean and adequate energy resources, uh, proper management of limited resources on the surface. So all of those things are very much part of right now what the Jackson School sees as, as major initiatives. I'll just, um, I'll add to that second what, what Dave said and. Um, Related to what uh, George was talking about, a lot of our strategic planning has been trying to bridge gaps between disciplines and teams and uh, various units in the Jackson School. And I can speak a little bit to the solid earth and tectonic processes theme, for example. We've been trying to envision ways of linking um, different depths in the earth, as Dave mentioned, as well as different time scales in earth history. And in particular, um, linking aspects of solid earth and tectonics to processes that are not typically associated with solid earth problems. So for uh, understanding feedbacks related to the evolution of life through time or um, the role of climate in influencing Earth's tectonic history over time. So I think a lot of our grand challenges um, are going to end up most of us, or end up requiring most of us to uh, step out of our comfort zone to some extent. And um, I think that's ultimately, like George mentioned, what makes them grand or perhaps overarching grand challenges. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
what do you guys see as some of their opportunities for the Jackson School to really lead, to set the tone instead of following the um, grand challenges that are sort of out there? What are our grand challenges? Hey. Okay. <laughs> so I'm up here, so I'll, I'll, I'll get on the horse now. <laughs> get, get excited. I, I think we have an, a tremendous opportunity to take advantage of the size and diversity to affect the way people look at the earth. And we can do this by enlisting our undergraduates, our graduate students, all of our scientists and our alumni to put a thousand people into observing the earth's surface. Now, I spend a lot of time looking at change over fairly short times at on coastlines, for example. And you would think we could do that pretty well. It's easy to go to the coastline. We should be able to understand what's going on and what the effect of, of pe people are having on that. But, but we can't because we don't actually have the kind of data that is really required to understand those systems. We could build something to show what synoptic data looked like. I think of it as the Texas Observatory where we get all of our students, beginning as freshmen and beginning as intro grad students, getting in, collecting data, QCing it by comparing it to existing data, and assembling it into our classes and into people's projects. We could really affect the way this country, and perhaps the world, and the State of the Union address, uh, <laughs> looks at our environment. But, it, require, we are, it requires us to really harness, uh, unleash the beast that is the, the, the size and the diversity of the school. Mm -hmm. So, oh, these are grand curiosity driven, pure science kind of directions we're talking about right now, but we also have a significant population here that's got to earn a lot of its own salary and uh, do things that are. Um, that people out there want to pay directly for. So surely, how do you integrate what they do at the Bureau with the grand challenges that we, we want to address here? It's been an interesting process working with this group of folks as we've been talking about grand challenges. And is this working? No. Okay. It's been a fun process working with this group of people as we talk about grand challenges. And I try to translate that into my own life as a Bureau of Economic Geology scientist. Because every year we have to raise basically all of our own money. And so it's, it's been an interesting uh, thought process. And I wanted to just show a few examples of how I think uh, the organization of the Bureau is a little different, but I think it's also um, a very interesting example of how this can happen. So one example I want to talk about is this new thing called TextNet. The state legislature just put in place in the last legislative session uh, funding for putting a seismic network across the entire state of Texas, filling in places where it does not currently exist, and also uh, funding for uh, portable seismic uh, devices to go to places of particular interest. And so I was thinking about this in terms, okay, so this seems like a practical thing for the Bureau to do. But when you fit it in with some of what George was talking about in his grand challenges, one of them that he mentioned was structure tectonics. How do we fall slip? Why and how and why does deformation localize into faults? And what is the role of fluids in relation to faulting? So I think we have an opportunity that keeping in mind scientific grand challenges, we now have a, a practical way of gathering data. As I mentioned, one of the, uh, some of the seismic uh, stations will be portable and can go to areas of interest. And that can include areas of uh, <coughs> human activity that might be influencing uh, seismic events. And so I think that in what the legislature has asked us to do, we have an opportunity to tie real scientific challenges how, does, how do fluids affect faults? What, in what cases do they, in what cases do they not affect faults? And, and to, but to give real uh, societal contribution from the work and to make uh, 
make our grand science actually apply to society needs. Anybody else have anything they'd like to contribute? Um, sure. I'll just mention related to that that um, you know, I'm interested in earthquake mechanics and one of the places where I think applied research is very complementary is actually some of the debates and discussions about fracking and wastewater prediction. Kind of like Shirley um, discussed and we've actually learned a lot from the pure science field from <coughs> debates and from trying to understand fracking and wastewater prediction and its role in, in developing earthquakes. Yeah, no, this is a, I mean, the thing which I, I often say to um, visiting students and parents that are interested in both being going into energy and going into the environment is that um, we just need to be studying science either way, uh, whether, you know, regardless of who's paying for it and regardless of which direction it's going, as long as we can be concentrating on doing the good science, we're, we're doing our job. But um, I want to talk to about our the true foot soldiers of our research effort here, uh, which are our graduate students, and ask, so how do we best use our graduate students and make our, include our graduate students in, and educate, educate them in what are becoming a part of Grand Challenge, becoming part of the, part of the solution? Well, one thing that occurs to me for this panel is it seems as though at the research scientist level and faculty level there is this understanding of what grand challenges are and as a graduate student I hadn't necessarily even heard the term before and so I'm wondering when in the education process do we actually come into context with the, this language what are the grand challenges and I do think that there's an emphasis on your first, in your first few semesters in graduate school on writing proposals, developing your project, coming up with your five minute elevator speech. Um, and then, speaking as a PhD student, you know, you go through your qualifying exam and then you're getting your data in your third year and you're getting your data some more in your fourth year and uh, you just might lose sight of how what you're doing really fits into this broader these broader challenges and their context. So I think that it would be nice to have a way to revisit, not just in your first couple semesters and then at your defense, but a way to revisit and put graduate students in place in a place where they can communicate. This is what I'm doing. This is why it's important. But then when you realize what you're really doing after you see what your data come out, then <laughs> Do that over again. It's definitely an iterative <laughs> process. And so, yeah, graduate student seminars sounds like an interesting idea, especially graduate student seminars that are a rotation really looking at grand challenge themes rather than just subdiscipline themes uh, would be one great way. And I'm sure there are other innovative ways to think about it. Oh, okay. How do we? Suddenly, I'm thinking about a statement that a Professor Bigelow at the University of Michigan stated when I went to him uh, asking if I could miss class because I had this opportunity to go down to Virginia on a gold exploration project. And Professor Bigelow said, you know, don't let school get in the way of your education. I mean, we've heard that before, haven't we? That amazing expression, don't let school get in the way of your of your education. I think that is a kind of an interesting mantra that applies to undergraduate and graduate and maybe to all of us. Sometimes we get so locked into um, almost like academic rituals and protocols that we have let school get in the way of broader learning. Well, actually, that lets me lead into one of the questions I've been given here is uh, many of our, these our teaching and societal goals we're talking about um, there's tend to break the mold of our traditional university structure, um, including some of the initiatives suggested by President Fenves, which he might talk to us about at lunchtime. So how can the JSG move forward and design a new model that maximizes our grand research and educational environment for learning? Well, 
Oh, I'm not supposed to answer. I've, I've talked too much already. <laughs> But uh, I mean, we're so David. We're just talking over lunch. Of, or you know, what what are the role what are the role of graduate students in the Texas Observatory, for example? Or yeah, so so I how do we do this? Is we, is we have to start, and it will be unorganized at first. It will become organized when we see when we see what is successful. But it does involve getting people out into the field or into the lab with your and doing new things. I mean, clearly, the most successful teaching I've ever done is always just a hair um, ahead of being a complete disaster. Because, because I, I am figuring it out in real time how to work with these students to, to do something we haven't done. And in the process of that, there is a, an intensity and clarity of, of learning with people but I think we we do have to find a way to to make our class teaching more fungible than it is and we, we have to figure that out. Mm -hmm. I have to say one of the most gratifying ways of learning is to actually do a project where you're working on something new and as an example of this it wasn't at UT, but I did field camp with Danny Stockley while he was at Kansas. And it was the difference between going out and doing an exercise, mapping an area that you return to every year, and then being graded against what the correct map should be. We did that for several weeks. And then the final portion was with Danny in Nevada, where we actually went to an area that wasn't mapped on the scale that we were mapping. So we were taking everything we had learned, and we felt like we were actually accomplishing something and contributing to something. And in the end, over years, you build a geologic map that didn't exist previously. And that's the type of classroom activities and learning experiences that you actually feel engaged in, in the long run. Well, uh, by the way, you're doing a great job of doing my job for me out there. So keep, uh, well, I'd say keep them coming, but we, um, uh, we got 10 minutes left or something. Uh, but uh, here's a really good question that leads on from there is, um, how do you teach students to be decision makers? Do the, like the ones who actually understand how souls may affect foundations, flooding, evaluating the real, you know, uh, evaluating flooding, how to critically evaluate the environment and the, environment and the environmental consequences of what we do on the surface. Um, I'm paraphrasing, sorry. Um, you know, how do we transform students from being classroom learners to decision makers? Yeah. One of the things that's come about since the Jackson School went into effect is more integration with students into the various units. And so one of the things that I think is exciting is that now we have graduate students who are intimately involved in our research. And many of our research projects um, have a very applied aspect to them. OK. Many of our research projects have very applied aspects to them. And so I think a lot of uh, students have a chance to learn that way. Um, one example I'd like to talk about is one of our IAs called FRAC. And the overall goal of the FRAC project, was, which has been in effect for many decades, ha is to better understand the formation of natural fractures. When did they form? How long did it take to form? But there are also very definite societal uh, importance to understanding these basic scientific questions, the interaction of natural fractures with hydraulic fractures, for example. And so one thing that I think is helping try to apply what they're learning uh, to making decisions like that and, and understanding real world situations and applying what they've learned is through uh, working with a group like FRAC. And so they're working with a group of uh, scientists at the Bureau. This uh, IA also has uh, faculty involvement. Uh, Randy Merritt is, is part of that. So it brings together uh, research scientists and professors and involve students now in the research in ways that I think um, didn't exist before the Jackson School uh, allowed. 
allowed you know, hero scientists to actually supervise graduate students and to involve them in the research in that way. One of the things that I enjoy doing from time to time is recreating in a seminar or maybe a class the news hour, PBS news hour. And so you, and you can have the camera, the video running if you like, but the students have prepared by reading articles on the basic science as well as applications. An, an example that worked really well, you know, the, uh, the big island of Hawaii uh, with these surges of collapse, the, the collapsing of the eastern margin of Hawaii. And so the setup was, okay, we have some panelists here, the students who are experts, and we have, you know, like Julie Woodward basically asking the questions. You know, should we be worried about the possibility of a collapse of half the island into the sea? And to be able to do that in like 20 minutes and in PBS NewsHour style, never using acronyms or never letting an acronym go untouched, you know, becomes a very interesting dynamic. The most important part of the dynamic is what happens after the 20 minutes. You can take an hour and just revisit it and say, what did you, what do you think you should have said? You know, how should you have influenced the decision? What tone of language might you have used? It's a fun way to kind of bump up against decision making and public policy and take our intellectual taxonomy that becomes so opaque and be forced to put it in terms that are for the public and for decision makers, the news hour. That actually leads, once again, brilliantly into another question that somebody's insightfully put forward for us. Uh, someone, um, the, there's been the observation that some of the most passionate and vocal members of the general population, and perhaps the political class, have been misinformed by false media, and they take these messages to heart. What are some examples of how individual scientists can affect these persons and their beliefs? Keeping in mind that these scientist social skills are not equivalent, that our scientific skills and our social skills are not equivalent. Um, and me, my. <laughs> what can we do? Okay, I'll bite. Um, so I think you have to. So I think first off, and this also goes with training decision makers and policy makers, you have to go out of the classroom. You actually have to, you don't have to be an advocate for something, but you have to at least get the information out there. And so you have to go to meetings where the information you have can be, can be useful. And probably a political forum isn't that place, but behind every political forum there is a panel that is deciding about something to be done that needs to be done. And those are the sorts of places where you can have a substantial effect. And, and we have had a substantial effect. So it is a, I started personally doing this about 10 years ago and I was way out of my comfort zone to go and just act as an advocate for information to say what we knew and what we didn't know. But you get better at it and it, it and now I bring students with so that they actually see how it works. Mm -hmm. Yep. Another example that I can think of of scientists trying to reach out to the general public and to politicians is a certain movie that was made through the Jackson School called The Switch. And that was, the goal was to try to convey information that we as geologists know to the general public and to wouldn't have access to that, but conveyed in a very um, logical, uh, unpolitical uh, way, uh, laying out the, the facts and, and letting the folks know more about the issues. And, and I got to say that I would have been terrified doing something like that, but I'm delighted that there are some geologists who are willing to, to go down that path. Well, I, I don't want to put in, put in one addition, which is we're supposed to be uh, forward-looking, so I think we need to ask Scott, when's the sequel? Uh, <laughs> Emily. Well, one thing 
Uh, I think it really comes down to communication and not being that far removed from an undergraduate that had never taken you know, a college science course. The whole process you need to go through from being, you know, graduating from high school to becoming a PhD student in geology, you need to learn an entire new language. And so it's like, you're, I remember a struggle to become familiar with the language, the words, the concepts, even just to read a scientific paper, you need to know this entire new vocabulary. So now I'm at a point where it's like, okay, I struggled to learn all this stuff. Now I can communicate in it. Now I need to figure out how to actually translate it back into common speak again. And so there's not, I think that it's on a personal basis at this point that some people choose to make an effort to do that. And especially my generation, some of the people I look up to of my peers is just something as simple as a blog, you know, that they, they are running, they're putting their research into context and it's something that's available to con be consumed by other people in our generation. Uh, but it's something I have to say I struggle with to this day, doing something very specialized, feeling at times, how do I put that back into a context that the general public can understand and care about? And it'd be great to actually have some sort of forum to exercise that and learn how to do that. There's a really, the most puzzling, well, the most thought-provoking question in a certain way that's come to me, what I want to go to now, is relates to this once again, a different angle. It seems that many departments across the nation have become embarrassed by the word geology. Can the Jackson School counter that trend and celebrate the geosciences. I'll just mention that I think that's a function of uh, geology has a very classic connotation to it, and yet now the discipline has become very multidisciplinary. And, and I've always been frustrated, for example, by the distinction geology versus geophysics. You know, tools that we use to investigate some of the same problems, and many of the same problems, probably almost all the same problems. So I think that, I think the reason, maybe part of the reason for that embarrassment is just the sense that it doesn't really reflect the rigid boundary between those two disciplines, for example, not disciplines. Um, we use, you know, we incorporate aspects of different fields into geology now, but more than we used to. I'm, I'm not worried about it. <laughs> I remember when I was growing up as a kid, they said, oh, what does your dad do? So, oh, he's a geologist. And then I went to college and I was in a class and the professor said, I'm a geologist. I'm not a geochemist. I'm not a geophysicist. Your dad, he's a geochemist. And so it's definitely a, something that is at the university level culture almost that has that distinction. Like as a kid or a lay person in the earth sciences, I wouldn't have necessarily ever learned to make that distinction all those things. So. All right. Well, our time is up. Um, I just will, I'll, I'll answer that last question myself just a little bit. I mean, for me, the key that hooked me in the first place and, and keeps me going is running into those individuals who so clearly just love what the heck they're doing and convey that. And that is uh, to the extent that we can make this an environment where people can do their very best, love what they're doing, and um, and exude from there, and I think we'll, uh, we'll be in good shape. Thank you very much for the geology panel. Um, sorry for the questions I didn't get to. You can ask me personally, um, or I can give them to, you know, we can give them to the next people they apply. Uh, but it's a coffee break right now, and we'll see you in 15 minutes. Thank you for the panelists.